morning. Judges chapter 16 um, is where we are at. Judges 16. Let me read the text, and I want to pause and meditate and then uh, dive into a text that we are, it is so critical for us to hear this morning. We are in the middle of a series, week two of a series called Unhindered, and what we're looking at is giants that are trying to keep us from pursuing Jesus and following Jesus, things in our lives that stop us from following Jesus with all of our hearts, souls, and minds. And last week we began by looking at the topic of shame, and this morning we'll be looking at the topic of lust and how this giant called lust debilitates us, hinders us from following and pursuing Jesus with all of our hearts. So Judge 16, let me read verses 1 through 5. Samson went to Gaza and there he saw a prostitute. And he went in to her, and the Gazites were told, Samson has come here. And they surrounded the place and set an ambush for him all night at the gate of the city. They kept quiet all night, saying, Let us wait till the light of the morning, and then we will kill him. But Samson lay till midnight, and at midnight he arose and took hold of the doors of the gate of the city and the two posts, and pulled them up, bar and all, and put them on his shoulders, and carried them to the top of the hill that is in front of Hebron. I don't know about you, but I see a picture of Jesus in that story that I just read, and you may look at me wondering, and I'll show you as we dive into the text, but I wanted to pause before we begin this series, or this message, and just pray for one second. So would you bow your heads? Lord Jesus, sometimes all of us get caught up in Gaza. We get, up, we get caught up in places where we shouldn't be doing things we shouldn't be doing. Would you teach us today how to tear off the gates and escape from the things from which we are trapped in. Would you teach us to slay giants, especially this giant that we are looking at this morning, this giant called lust? Would you help us to overcome? This giant has taken so many down. We don't want to be a casualty. We don't want to be wounded in battle. We want to be victorious. And so God, today, we plead, would you help us? Let our hearts be open to hearing your voice. Let our lives be open to being filled with your spirit. But would you make us giant slayers today that this giant called lust will lay wasted on the side because you give us the power to overcome it. We pray this in the name of Jesus who slayed all the giants for us. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Like a door-to-door salesman, he shows up at the doorsteps of our mind. He looks through the windows of our eyes and with a knowing wink, he opens his bag of eye candy and All of a sudden, we are piqued with interest and we open the door just to crack. And this giant called lust slips inside our lives. And with practice skill, his soothing fingers begin to massage our conscience with seductive promises of pleasure and enjoyment. And as our moral as our moral fiber begins to relax, we begin to drift into the dreamland dreamland of forbidden fantasies. And it doesn't take long for lust who came in as an appealing salesman to now turn into a terrifying giant. Smoldering fantasies now become a raging inferno of desire, driving us to grab for the fruit that's forbidden. We now teeter on the edge of the precipice and red lights of awakened conscience begin to flash in our minds that says, 
There is a danger ahead. Be careful. Turn back. Don't go forward. But you and I know that lust is incredibly hard to shake. See, all of us try to shake it, but this giant, he's relentless. He pursues you over and over again. He never gives up. You lock the doors and he will climb through a thousand windows from a widescreen TV to a smartphone screen to computer monitors to photos on a magazine to conversations to visual images to even when you fall on your knees to pray, unholy thoughts begin to fill your mind. Lust is the original stalker. Invite him in and he's the guest that will never leave. Let him spend the night. And he becomes the guest from hell. You will never get him out unless you pull him out dragging and screaming. You know, his resume is quite impressive. A lust for power caused the greatest of God's archangels to fall from the heights of heaven to the depths of hell. Lust for the forbidden fruit turned paradise into wasteland. David, a man after God's own heart, was a man after God's own heart, but lust sucked him into the heart of darkness. Solomon was the wisest man that ever lived, but lust turned him into a fool and toppled his entire kingdom. See, in an age where we are inundated with visual eye candy 24 hours a day, seven days a week, lust is the biggest giant that you and I will ever face. It's the most persistent, it's the most pervasive of all giants, and his appetite is unappeasable. Feed him long enough, and he will become too big to handle. That's why stats say that two out of every five men that attend church on a regular basis is addicted to pornography. Listen, it is imperative that we slay this giant. It is imperative that this giant does not have a stronghold in our lives. And I want to share a principle with you that is so important for us to understand. Here's, it, here's what it is. It says, lust passions will be served. It demands, it militates, it tyrannizes. Lust passions will be served. It demands, it militates, it tyrannizes. Do you know who said those words? It was a man by the name of the Marquis de Sade who penned those words. No one knew this giant lust more than this 18th century French nobleman. The very name de Sade is synonymous with the word lust. From his name, de Sade, do we get the words sadism and sadistic. As a self-centered young man, he once said, I only want to pursue the promptings of my desires. Is that so difficult? He spent his entire life pursuing pleasure. And even though he was educated in a Jesuit school and knew scriptures, they saw it took pleasure in unspeakable depravities. In the 18th century, he shocked the nation of France when he began to write pornographic essays about his escapades. So he eventually lust turned this porn philosopher into a psycho pervert who hurt others for his pleasure. And after serving prison stints for crimes against women, he was eventually locked away for good. He died a sad sadist, penniless, despised by his family. Lust passions will be served. It demands, it militates, it tyrannizes. Ultimately, it destroys you. They saw it at, in his last days in prison, pick up the Bible that he had abandoned as a youth, and over and over his scriptures kept turning to the story of a man named Samson in the Old Testament the story that we read this morning. And we don't know why he was drawn to it. Maybe he saw himself in the picture of Samson. Maybe you will as well as we learn the story of Samson because like Samson, all of us struggle with lust. We all do. If you're young, 
we struggle with what I call hot lust. These are lusts that are the hot lust of youthful passion, wanting desires and pleasures. But listen, just because you're older doesn't mean that you've gotten past lust. When you get older, you struggle with what I call cold lust, the lust for security, the lust for affirmation, the lust for financial security, the lust for peace, the lust for affluence. See, lust will pursue you until the day you die. Lust will keep after you as long as you have breath. That's why we need to hear the story of Samson before we get to the condition of the Marquis de Sade. And the story of Samson is not a pretty story. It's a tragic story. It's one of the most saddest stories in scriptures. And we're going to see a text this morning that is probably one of the most saddest verses in the entire Bible. But Samson's story doesn't start with horror or in despair. His story actually started with a lot of promise. He was born into a righteous family, a God-fearing family, parents who loved God and pursued God, people of prayer. He was set apart from God, for God for ministry yet even before he was born. And when he grew up, he was elevated to be the supreme judge of the nation. He was the strongest man that ever lived. In a single battle, he killed a thousand soldiers with a jawbone of a donkey. He was Superman without a cape. He had nothing on the Avengers. But Superman had his kryptonite. And that kryptonite weakened him. Samson also had his kryptonite. He had eyes for the wrong kind of woman, and ultimately, that took him down. See, as I think about it, I think all of us have some kind of kryptonite in our lives. What's your kryptonite? What is it that keeps pulling you down away from Jesus? What is the lust that you struggle with? See, in the end of the story, a shady lady by the name of Delilah with a pair of scissors ultimately took down this Israeli superman. This mega warrior who single-handedly crushed lions and routed armies and now has become a pathetic shell of wasted potential because he couldn't say no to lust. Samson is now the poster child for instant gratification. See, like so many folks today, like so many of us, he sacrifices the permanent on the altar of the immediate. So much potential, so much hope, and now it's bound and caged. So we've got to ask the question, how do we slay this giant who toppled a mighty warrior by the name of Samson? How do we slay this giant who took down the man that was known as the man after God's own heart, David? How do we slay this giant who took down the wisest man that ever lived by the name of Samson? How do we defeat him? How do we make sure that we don't become like these heroes of our faith? And this morning what I want to do is I want to share three things with you that I pray will be helpful to you as we slay this giant. Three things from our text that we will see. Number one, an unguarded strength is the gateway for the enemy. Let me repeat that because I want to make sure you're paying attention. An unguarded strength is the gateway for the enemy. I don't know if you caught that, but that sounds counterintuitive because it's not our strengths that often take us down, is it? It's our weaknesses. It's our weaknesses that usually get us into trouble But for Samson, it wasn't his weakness that did him in. Ultimately, it was his strength. The strength that God gave him is what took him down. How can that be? Let me tell you a little bit about the story of Samson. It begins in Judges 13, verse 1. And here's what the story says. And again, the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of God. So the Lord gave them into the hand of the Philistines for 40 years. The story begins with a backdrop of weakness. And I don't know if you notice in that text that word, again. Again, the people did evil in the sight of God. Isn't that our story? We do it not once and we're over. We do it again and again and again. We know it's wrong, but we keep doing it over and over and over again. And the Bible says that God handed 
the Israelites over to the Philistines for slavery for 40 years. But here's the fascinating part. The Philistines, to capture Israel, never had to pick up a sword. Here's how they did it. The Philistines were the ones who came up with the idea of melting iron, melting iron into plows. And with iron plows, a man could um, till more acreage and earn more profit. And because of their lust for money and their desire to have more, the Jewish people went into debt just to get their hands on this state-of-the-art equipment that the Philistines owned. And the Philistines charged them ridiculous prices. And now the Jews were in debt. And to pay off their debt, the Jews began to sell their children into slavery. They began to take their daughters and marry them off to Philistine men so that their debts could be erased. And through intermarriage with people who were not followers of God, God's people took on the lifestyle and the gods of the Philistines. The Israelites were not captured by military conquest. They were captured by cultural seduction. So that now the Israelites had the lifestyle, they had the thinking, they had the gods of the Philistines. You couldn't tell a difference between a follower of God and a Philistine in those days. The Philistines had captured the culture without ever picking up a sword. God's people captured by the surrounding culture sounds very much like today, doesn't it? Lust demands, it militates, it tyrannizes, it destroys you. And after 40 years of slavery, God raises up a champion to liberate the people of Israel. And you read the story in Judges 13, 1 through 5. There is a woman who is barren with a child, and she earnestly pleads to God, God, give me a baby. And all of a sudden, one day, an angel shows up to her, promises her a son, but he gives her a warning that you'll see in Judges 13, verses 4 and 5. It says, be careful. Drink no wine or strong drink. Eat nothing unclean, for behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. No razor shall come upon his head, for that child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb, and he shall begin to save Israel from the hand of the Philistines. See, this boy was set apart for God even before he was born. The angel says he shall be a Nazarite. It was an ancient religious order of Judaism. Nazarites took a vow that they would never cut their hair, that they would live a life of chastity and purity, that they would never touch anything unclean that they would follow a rigid diet and abstain from alcohol. It was a radical call. It was countercultural to everything else that was going on in culture. See, when a Nazarite walked into a room, it was kind of like a, trying to imagine an Amish guy sitting at the front row of the boxing match last night. It was like an alien. You don't belong there. You don't fit in. Right? Samson's lifestyle was supposed to be 100% countercultural to what everyone else was doing. Listen, it's only when we live a completely different lifestyle can we begin to influence the culture that we live in. If we do what everything else, everyone else does, if we talk the way everyone else talks, if we believe the way everyone else believes, if we fear the way everyone else fears, we're not influencers of culture, we're part of culture. It is only when we march to the beat of a different drummer can we create a different music than what the world is playing. Listen, compromise is never going to set you free. Conformers will never become transformers. Our call is to live a radically different lifestyle from the world, i.e. the teachings of Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus said we are to be radically different in how we live, in our behaviors. Samson has to be radical, and listen, so do we if we're going to see freedom in our lives. We have to. The story of Samson begins with so much promise, so much potential. Here's a man that's been set out by God to do great things for God, but along the way, something goes wrong. You get to chapter 14, Samson, Samson is now a young man. The 24th verse of 
the 13th chapter, it says, the Spirit of God began to stir in Samson. But the same time God's Spirit was stirring in him, there was another sinister spirit stirring in him as well. It was a spirit called lust. Listen, just because you come to church and worship Jesus and have the presence of Jesus in your life doesn't mean the enemy will not work in your life as well. He will try to attack you. He will try to creep through, creep through any open door you give him. This is why Scripture says that we have to be watchful. We have to be careful of what we do. Judges 14, 1 and 2. Um, Samson sees a woman, and he t- comes home to his mom and dad and says, I want that woman, and it's a Philistine woman. He says, go and get her for me. I want to marry her. And mom and dad beg with him, hey, this is not the woman for you. You shouldn't marry him. But he responds in verse 3, get her for me. And dad meekly goes off to arrange a marriage that was doomed for failure right from the beginning. See, this man-child was used to getting whatever he wanted from his parents. They spoiled, they spoiled rotten their only son that they received at an old age. Listen, this didn't happen overnight. Can I just pause here and speak to parents that are in this room, or potential parents? Listen, you're, you are called to raise your children to be giant slayers. That is your role as a parent, to raise them up to be giant slayers. Your children need to learn moral discipline when they are young. Moral discipline is established brick by brick from the time our children are toddlers. On the flip side, instant gratification can also become a way of life early on. Samson's parents were righteous people. They walked in the way of God. They loved God, but they were also enablers. They never knew how to say no to Samson. Listen, it is okay to say no to your kids. They don't need to get everything just because everyone else has it. They don't need to have everything just because that's what everyone else is doing. It is better to raise them up by saying no so that they can follow Jesus with their lives than raise them up so that we, and enable them to pursue things that will ultimately destroy them. Say no when you need to say no. Be wise in how you raise them. You have to equip your children to fight lust from its earliest appearance. You know what? God gave Samson great victories. He was a man that was constantly having victories, but Samson's lust overwhelmed him again and again. We read in Judges 16.1 that one day Samson went to Gaza, and there he saw a prostitute, and he spent a night with her. See, Samson was addicted to the adrenaline rush. He loved living on the edge. He sees what he wants, and he takes it. Gaza was one of the five major cities in the, of the Philistines. It had a huge fortress around it. Gaza is still in the news today. It has the highest walls and the largest gates. And Samson was public enemy number one in Gaza. He's the one that killed numerous Philistines before. But he still goes into the middle of Gaza and finds a prostitute. Why does he do this? Because Samson is like so many people who love the adrenaline of living on the edge, of pushing the envelope, thinking, I'm untouchable. This will never hurt me. This will never affect me. Lust overwhelms common sense. Your lust will overwhelm your common sense. The Philistines surrounded the prostitute's house in order to kill him. But here's the thing. God made Samson a smart man. Samson was incredibly smart. His long hair made him strong. The Philistines thought they had him trapped in this house, and they thought there was no way that Samson was going to get out. But Samson, and they locked the gates to the city. Scholars tell us that those gates were massive, studded with nails, covered with iron to make them fireproof. They probably weighed hundreds of pounds But the Philistines hadn't reckoned on Samson's superhuman strength. And Judges 16.3 says that he slipped by them in the dark, ripped up the gateposts and carried the gates on his shoulders to the top of the hill that faces Hebron. 
See, that may not sound much to you unless you go to Israel. And George and Shannon might be able to confirm this for me, but Hebron is 38 miles away from Gaza. 38 miles. This man carried hundreds of pounds of iron on his back. You can begin to see this. Samson had his weaknesses. He has eyes and he takes whatever he wants to see it. But God also gave him a great mind. He was a brilliant man. He was a tactician. He was a thinker. He was the original Jack Bauer. He just, he just didn't need 24 hours. He could get out of any situation super fast. He had the strength to muscle his way out of every tight spot. See, our problem isn't necessarily our weakness. Our weaknesses get us into trouble, but our strengths say that we could find a way out of our trouble. For 20 years, every time Samson got in trouble, he muscled his way out. And now we come to the third woman in Samson's life. Her name is Delilah. On the battlefield, Samson's a champ, but when it comes to women, this man is a sucker. He, he just messes up over and over again. Three women in his life. The first is a non-believer, the second is a prostitute, and the third one is on the payroll of the Philistine CIA. He has no luck with women. All three of them were Philistines. None of them loved God. Talk about sleeping with the enemy. But Samson loved the game. For Samson, the game was as natural as breathing. Sinning became a habit, and habits eventually become hard to break. Listen, lust takes us into a downward spiral. And you could read the details when you get home on Judges 16, 4 through 20. The Philistine rulers paid Delilah to discover the source of Samson's strength. Four times she asked him what his, strength is, what his strength is. They're having pillow talk in the middle of the night, and she says, hey, what is the source of your strength? And three times he lies to her. So after the first story, the Philistines rush in, Samson's all tied up, and Samson all of a sudden breaks out of his bondage, and he destroys the Philistines that come to him. Delilah comes back to him and says, tell me the secret of your story. He, you would think that after the first time, it'd be a warning and say, I need to get out of this. I need to get out of here, right? That this woman is not going to be good for me. But he does it a second time. And what he tells her, she goes and tells the Philistine CIA, they do the exact same thing. He breaks out, he gets out of it. And he does it a third time. Call me crazy, but by now, this man should be leaving. This woman is out to kill me, but Samson loves the game. He thinks that he can handle this thing because of his strength. The fourth time, he decides to tell her the truth. The truth. This is how cocky he is. He thinks there is nothing that could stop him. Your weaknesses get you into trouble. Your strengths make you think that you can get out of trouble. Do you get it? Samson treated his, his lust like they were little pets that he could control. But as they grew, he depended on his strength to keep them at bay. But listen, an unguarded strength is the gateway to the enemy. 1 Corinthians 16, Paul warns, flee from sexual immorality. In 1 Corinthians 10, he says, flee from immorality. First Timothy, he warns the young pastor, flee from materialism. And again, just to remind him again, he says, flee from youthful lust. Listen, there's a lot of sins that we need to fight against, but there's also a lot of sins that we just need to run away from. You don't need to be around it. There are sins like social injustice and Mm, abuse and stuff that we need to take a stand and say we will not tolerate this and we will fight against it with all that we have but there are some sins that we need to run because we need to get away from it as quickly as we possibly can and that's why Paul and the writers of the gospels will warn us over and over flee from the stuff flee from it I joke all the time but when you see a pornographic image on a computer screen you don't just pray that God, that image will disappear you turn it off and you run you don't just look and hope it just disappears that's not what you're supposed to do run from it but listen fleeing isn't always easy is it Samson finally gives in to Delilah's nagging and spills out his gusts 
Verse 19 tells us he was asleep on her lap when she cut his hair. An unguarded strength is the gateway for the enemy. Have you gone to sleep? Have you begun to cuddle in the lap of lust? Thinking that your strength will bail you out. Have you began to lie in the lap of Delilah thinking, I've gotten out of it before, I can easily get out of it again. And listen, we all have our versions of Samson's hair. Maybe for you it's a quick wit or a persuasive tongue, or fancy footwork, or ready excuses, or lots of money, or a winning personality, or friends in high places, or good theology, or the ability to put on the brakes just before it goes over the cliff, or it's a solid prayer life, or the idea that God's let you go this long, that maybe God just doesn't care about this. But listen, you're lying in the lap of Delilah, and listen, she has scissors in her hands. You've trusted in your strength for so long, you become complacent and it will catch up to you. Atop a hill above a mountain in Greece is an old Venetian fortress. For centuries it guarded the sea lanes. Massive and impenetrable walls, miles in length, guarded the fortress from attack by land. But the walls only covered three sides of the city. On the back side were mountains with steep cliffs that the the people of the city thought no one would ever be able to climb it. No one would ever be able to scale these cliffs on on this mountain. So no walls were ever built there. They thought that mountain was their strength. But the day came when an army of the Ottoman Turks came to seize the fortress. For months they laid siege, wave after waves, Turks charged up the hills against the garrisons, only weakness that they had, but the walls surrounding its natural vulnerability to land kept the city strong and safe. But one night the unthinkable happened. Somehow Turkish commanders managed to scale the cliffs that rose from the sea and caught the city by surprise. Listen, we build walls around our weaknesses, but we leave our strengths unguarded. The enemy of our soul attacks unguarded strength. What was true for that fortress is equally true for Samson. What is true for Samson is equally true for us. Know your weaknesses. Guard them well, but never assume that your strengths are invulnerable for attack. Guard them carefully. Like Samson, if your strength is scheming and planning, don't play a game of verbal cat and mouse thinking that your wit is unbeatable. If your strength is in your hair, don't go to sleep in the head of Delilah when she has the scissors in her hand. An unguarded strength is the gateway for the enemy. Number two, lust is not a pet to be fed, but a beast to be caged. Lust is not a pet to be fed, but a beast to be caged. For years, Samson played with his lust as if they were little pets that he could enjoy. And he didn't notice that his baby lust had now grown into hungry predators. I'm reminded of the lines of Mark Anthony's Greek tutor when he uttered in frustration, Oh Marcus, oh Marcus, oh colossal child, able to conquer the world, but unable to conquer temptation. Listen, I want you to remember someone else. Go back to Judges 16.3 to that superhuman feat, Samson ripping those gates from Gaza and going, carrying them all the way to Hebron. I said it earlier, but I see a foreshadow of Jesus here. Over in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus makes this statement, I will establish my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. See, surely Gaza was a stronghold, but its gates could not prevail even against a flawed man of God filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. We too are flawed. Like Samson, we too fall prey to our lust. We too are called to tear down the walls. Jesus said that. 
He said, filled with his power and with his presence, we are able to uproot the gates of hell that stand against us. Why are we able to do such a great feat? See, it's foreshadowed in this night in Gaza. Samson carried those heavy wooden gates to a hill near Hebron. And from that hill, you can see the city of Jerusalem. See, Jesus carried the gates of hell on his back in the form of a cross. He carried it to his own hill. And then he hung on it. And as he hung on that cross, he suffered an eternity of hell for our sins. And on that cross, he paid for Samson's visits to the prostitute. He prayed for all of his foolish games with Delilah. And he did the same for you and he did the same for me. Jesus paid for our sins on the cross. See, we, because of that, we no longer have to play the game of lust. Instead, we can find our freedom and strength in the one who tore down the only gate that matters in our life. See, we can go out in his strength and demolish the city of giants. We can take down gates, then destroy them, and no longer be bound by lust or shame or defeat or discouragement because he has won the battle for us. See, he has caged the beast. He has conquered the enemy and we no longer have to feed it. Rather, we can feed on Jesus. We can grow on Jesus. We can love Jesus. We can pursue Jesus and he will satisfy our desires. He will satisfy our longings. He will satisfy our wants because he is all sufficient. He is satisfying. He is, he is absolutely beautiful. He is eter eternally grateful, gratifying. He is Jesus. You don't have to feed on lust anymore because Jesus said, I've destroyed it. Number three, cut off from our strength, we are chained to our weakness. Cut off from our strength, we are chained to our weakness. See, Samson finally gave Delilah the secret to his strength, the long hair. But here's the truth. It wasn't the uncut hair that gave Samson strength. It was his obedience to God that gave him strength. It was him obeying God by saying, I will not cut this hair that God gave me, that, God, that gave him the strength. See, when the Philistines pounced on him, and to his great horror, he was now weak as a kitten. Here's one of the most tragic verses in the entire Bible, Judges 16, verse 20. Delilah wakes him up and says to Samson, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. And he woke from his sleep and he said, I will go out as at other times and shake myself free but he did not know that the Lord had left him. He did not know that the Lord had left him. See, the presence of God was the strength of Samson all of this time. It wasn't his hair. And listen, as believers of Jesus, we only have one covering and that's our Lord Jesus. He covers us with his blood, his love, his spirit, his power, his presence. He is our covering. The devil and Delilah knew the secret to our strength. If he can get us to put our trust, not in Jesus, but in our own scheming, in our own manipulation, and in our own human strength, and then curl us up in the lap of complacency, then he can separate us from our spiritual covering, just like Delilah separated Samson from his hair. Samson doesn't get it. And listen, neither do we sometimes. Verse 20, he says, I'll go out as I did before and shake myself free. He thought he could trust in his own scheming and his own strength. See, that's the deception of lust. We know it's wrong to lie in Delilah's lap. But we think, oh, we can beat the odds. We think we can get away with it. We think, oh, we didn't get caught before. We can 
do it again one more time. Oh, it's not that big of an issue. It's, it's just my body. It's just what I do in the privacy of my room. Your little pets will eventually become monsters that destroy you. Be warned. Samson's story is a story of a life that is wasted. God blessed him like few other men, but he wasted God's grace on shady ladies, wild parties, and ballroom brawls. So God had to break him, just like he has to break us. And notice how God deals with Samson. You know what was Samson's worst enemy? His eyes. Judges 14.1, he saw a Philistine woman that was attractive and he took her. Judges 16.1, he saw a prostitute spend the night with her. Judges 16.21, the Philistines gouged out his eyes. As horrific as that sounds, can I suggest to you that is probably the best thing that happened to Samson. That was the grace of God in the life of Samson. Jesus said it this way in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, if your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. Samson's eyes never focused on sin again. Samson's feet were always taking him to places where he shouldn't have been going. But notice Samson now, he is chained to a grinder's wheel in a Philistine prison. Chained to that wheel, he is forced to confront God in a black pit. He had been strong, he had, full, he had been full of swagger, he had been boastful, but now he is a bald-headed, sightless clown. That's what he is. Children throw rocks and mud at him. He's a sideshow freak in a cheap carnival. But God isn't destroying Samson here. He's allowing the natural consequences of Samson's sin to crush his rebellious heart and now restoring Samson to usefulness for heaven. If you have been caught, if you have been exposed, don't blame God. Thank God. Because that is the grace of God in your life. If your sins have been exposed, that is God's mercy on your life that he did not allow you to destroy yourself. 